Hi, my name is Markus Eggenberger and I work as a product manager at Vector where I'm responsible for the virtualization of non-automotive ACUs and their integration with our testing tools. Welcome to my presentation about functional testing of software applications and how to stimulate and observe your system under test using virtual environments. I want to start this session with a slide that you should have seen earlier today in the presentation of my colleague Ute Katranski, where we can see the layers of test interfaces with regards to your system on the test. Of course, if we think of our system on the test, we can think of it as this big black box that just receives some input values, processes them and generates output values. But on the inside, we have different levels where we can test at. At the innermost level, we have the code boundary. There we have the implementations of individual functions or objects. And of course, since we have this in-depth knowledge about the implementation, we test them typically with unit tests. If we go one level up, we come to the functional system boundary at the software level. And in this case, we have the integration of the individual components of the individual objects and the logic. But furthermore, we have now the runtime dynamics of your system, which means that we have a behavior of your system over time. This is the level where we say we test at the SIL level, at the software in, in the loop level. And finally, at the outermost level, we have, have the, again the functional system boundary, but now we include the hardware. And this is the domain of the classical hill tests where you really have the final integrated target device, for example, sitting on your desk and tested with dedicated test equipment. But today we will focus on the green box, on the sill box, we will focus on the functional system perspective for your software and how to test them efficiently in virtual environments. So what is this functional system boundary? Sure, we just said that we include the runtime dynamics now and not only have the code and the implementation of your functions, but what is actually in this box? What is the runtime dynamics? First of all, we have the task scheduling, which is what brings your system to life. You have some management of when is what piece of software executed. You have uh, the advancement of state machines and the interaction over time, which is really important for the long-term behavior of your SUT. But we not only have things like the scheduling, we also have pieces of code to interact with the environment of your system on the test. For example, we have the hardware abstraction layers, which means uh, some APIs that you can use to access I.O. pins, for example, or also interact with sensors and actuators. And lastly, we also have some pieces for backend communication, which is quite often the case for IoT devices. And in this case, you have some libraries that you can use to communicate with backend services that can be, for example, hosted in the cloud or some local services like some smart home gateway or other smart devices that are nearby. So this is already quite a lot and the question might be what is not in the box and first of all it's not that much but definitely not the actual hardware and also you don't have target architecture specific code in there like uh, some sort of inline assembly for bootstrapping your device and booting it up. So in summary we can say the, the functional system comprises all software aspects to interact with the environment. And when we think about uh, SIL testing, it makes sense to talk a bit about task scheduling uh, and the different kinds of IoT devices where it can be quite different. This is not some academic scope here, how task scheduling can differ, but it might help you to see where fits your application. And uh, since it depends, or since depending on the task scheduling, you would access the IOs in a different way, it kind of makes sense to have a big uh, picture of what the different kinds are. So if we think about very small IoT devices, very cheap ones, we often have software that runs bare metal directly on the device itself. And in this case, what we can find quite commonly is that we have a fixed static schedule that is executed by your embedded software. 
the static schedule is triggered by timer interrupts in your device and the interrupt handler for your timer then executes the task that is queued or registered for that uh, specific time slot. When you execute this task, you can then pull the input uh, input values. And depending on the values that you read, you can then trigger some further action in your software. On the extreme opposite end, you have uh, the possibility to have no scheduling or, or barely no scheduling at all and simply directly react on input value changes. And in that case, you would have um, not only timer interrupts in your device that you're using, but also interrupts, for example, for I.O. pins um, that can be triggered when there is a change in the input value, uh, for example, a change from high to low, and you can register interrupts for them. And you don't know in, in advance when these interrupts will be triggered, so there is no fixed scheduling. But when they trigger, you want to execute a certain piece of software. And this is often the case for purely reactive soft, uh, systems that directly transform an input value whenever they receive it, or uh, if you interact directly with them, for example, for, uh, by pressing some buttons. On the larger end, if we think about more powerful IoT systems, we can have software that is actually running on a real operating system, for example, some POSIX or Linux system, um, thinking about your Raspberry Pis there. And if this is the case, we have dynamically scheduled tasks. And in this case, the tasks rely on timers or events that are provided by your operating system. And this, of course, gives you a high degree of flexibility of how and when to access your input and output values. For example, you can still pull the input values, you can register a timer in your operating system, or you can react also on the events, you can uh, register event handlers for um, input value changes. And if we think about a larger scale as well, if we think about the backend information, you can have timers with a large period where you say you're periodically fetching some uh, backend information, like some weather data, for example, or you can also have some hook where you register or receive commands from a backend. Uh, think about something in your smart uh, home which you operate with your um, with with your smartphone, and whenever you change something there, you want to trigger a behavior in your IoT device, and this can also be handled by um, dynamically registering an event for a backend communication. Again, not an academic task, but I think it helps to make sure to find where your device belongs to and in which category. So now that we have identified what we do want to test, I want to introduce you to the concept of the SIL adapter to show you how we can test it. So we want to have our system under test tested at this pure SIL level. And for that, obviously, we have to get rid of the hardware. And instead, we replace it with a virtual execution environment, such as a Linux machine, a VM, or a Docker container, or simply your Windows operating system. Since we want to test the runtime dynamics, we can touch the task scheduling and that has to stay in your software. But we do not want to have the code that accesses the hardware because it's simply not there. And we do not want to have actual backend communication because we want to have everything fully under control. So instead, we can use a SIL adapter, which allows us to communicate with a virtual environment that is then provided by Kendu for software. So a few words about the SIL adapter before we go into the details. The SIL adapter is a piece of software that is custom tailored to the environment that you need. And you can put it into your software to replace the, any interfaces to, real, uh, to the real environment with interfaces to the software or virtual environments. And it is both suited for both physical and software environments. And it is. Uh, and you can use it in pretty much any way independently if you're polling or uh, your IOs or you have an event-driven IOs. And we also support atomic transactions. So how do we specify the SIL adapter? For that, we can use the Vector Communication Description Language or short VCDL. You will probably hear, hear more about this today um, in the future sessions. The VCDL is a uh, language to model communication at the application level and it is independent of any concrete communication protocol however you can bind it to dedicated protocols and since it is suited for the application level it is perfect to specify and generate our SIL adapter. <laughs> 
The general outline of a VCDL file looks something like this. We put everything into a namespace. We can declare data types and we can declare interfaces that are the interesting parts. To, and then we can instantiate our objects to communicate with our SUT. So let's have a closer look. If we want to model our physical environment, we often want to exchange physical quantities such as temperatures, pressure values, or voltages. And those values typically have a last is best semantic, which means once you provide something in the virtual environment, it is there to stay and cannot go away. For example, a room temperature is always there and it cannot be not there. There's always a value. Depending on the direction, you either have sensors to provide data about the environment or you have actuators that modify the environment. So let's have a look how to model them. If we think about the sensor, um, we can use the interface declaration with the provided data keyword, which means provide data to the SUT. Here it is simply of type double and we gave it the name temperature. Then we can make an instance of this interface to make it available to our SUT and give it the binding to, to connect it with the, um, with the SUT. For the opposite direction, we have here an actuator, a simple switch interface. And since now the SUT has to provide the data, Canoe is in the role of consuming it. Therefore, here this, the keyword consumed. And again, we can have multiple instances of this interface. So we can have multiple switches, for example, in our SUT. On the other hand, if we think about software system interface, we have pretty much any kinds of data exchange between two pieces of software. It can be simply a function call. It can be a call to a remote or backend service, uh, producer consumer queues, or simply global variables. The possibilities are kind of endless. And so are the data types. We no longer have simply physical data types. Often we have still some scalar values, but it can also be some abstract enumeration, complex data types, structs, lists, whatever, you name it. But therefore, um, we have to provide this ability to model such structs here on the example of a weather service, which provides weather in the, uh, in the form of a struct with temperature, humidity, and wind speed. And the weather service itself is, uh, you can think of it as a service and therefore we model it as a method. Here you see the keyword provided method for that. The method is called get forecast and it returns some weather data depending on the zip code that you gave to it. Again, instantiation with the object keyword. So now that we've seen how to declare a SIL adapter, let's see how you can integrate it into your code. Coming back to the example of the sensor with which provides temperature values, we can differentiate how to access it. If we access it in a poll manner, we typically have a function that simply provides the current value of the sensor. And we can simply replace that call with a call to the SIL adapter. And for that, we can find everything that we've declared in the VCDL file. You see the namespace AC, we find the object sensor, and we can simply read out its temperature member. On the other hand, if we follow an event-driven approach, you probably have some sort of an interrupt handler that is triggered whenever the input value has changed and you have registered that input, uh, input or interrupt handler in your setup code. So instead of registering the interrupt handler, you can simply register it with the SIL adapter. For example, you can use here the register on change callback, which is triggered whenever a new value that is different from the last one is arrived. And on the other hand, if we want to use an actuator, it's simply the other direction. We don't read out the property, we write to it. Again, here we have the example of our switch that we used earlier. And to trigger that actuator, we can have, for example, the set switch function, and it simply sets the new value to the switch state property. It's as simple as that. And if you write to it, that value is immediately transferred to Canoe. If we think about remote calls to access, for example, backend services, we have again the weather service that we want to access. And we simply replace the function call that we have with a function call to the weather service provided by the SIL adapter. Here you see we have the same namespace, we have the object, and we have the method that we can call. And since we're not limited to the native languages, we can also do the same thing in Python. 
Now that we know how to connect our system on a test to a virtual environment, let's see what Canoe for Software can do for you to bring the whole thing to life. Since the VCDL is native to Canoe for Software, you can use all the features that you know from Canoe for Software to stimulate and observe your SUT. For example, you can use a custom panel to uh, provide some sort of virtual inputs and outputs to your SUT and you have some knobs that you can turn and interact with your SUT. You can have panels to directly call functions in your SUT or you can use signal generators uh, that apply some sort of a waveform to the input values. On the other hand, we can use the analysis features, such as the trace window, where you see all the values that have been sent to or received from your system under test via the SIL adapter. We can plot all those values over time with the graphics windows, and we can use the state tracker to observe how state machines change. Of course, we can also apply automated tests that have been provided or authored with VTest Studio and run then them with Kindle for software and you get a nice verdict what has worked and what has not worked. Okay, let me conclude my presentation. We've seen that for SIL testing, the runtime dynamics of your software are highly important and that you can use the SIL adapter in any kinds of task scheduling to access or interact with your virtual environment. And the VCDL language provides you a high degree of flexibility to tailor your SIL adapter just according to your needs so that you can stimulate and observe your SUT with Canoe for software. I'm now looking forward to your questions. Thank you.